Well, good afternoon, man. It is. It's a real pleasure, even an honor here to be with you all. And so I'd like to bring to you a message. It's a little bit intimidating after the unbelievable teaching we've had already today. But I tell you, it's just a real pleasure for me to bring you something from the Word of God. And I'm very grateful to say that just in the planning and the operation of the Holy Spirit, how General Boykin ended his wonderful message leads right into mine. So I'd like you to open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin just by taking a look at verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Now, I do want to forewarn you, I am going to be asking you to turn in your Bibles to several different passages to just take a look at several different verses in the course of the time that I spend with you here this afternoon. Um, we're not going to be putting the verses up on the screen on the PowerPoint. I mean, there's just something significant about men looking up things in their own Bible. I mean, even if you're looking at it on your smartphone or whatever, at least you're looking it up on your own Bible or device or whatever. So we're going to do that together. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 10. Father in heaven, I pray, I pray that you'd be gracious enough to extend the blessing that we've had since last night meeting together as men. Lord, would you please just extend that another 45 minutes or so? and pour out your grace upon us now as we take a look at your word. And I pray that you'd speak to us as men in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Now I trust that this is a rather familiar passage to many of you. If it's not, I give you a real charge just from one man to another. You need to be very familiar with this passage that speaks about the warfare that every Christian man takes part of in this spiritual sense. It's essential that you become aware of this, and there's a lot of good teaching, so if you're not very familiar with this passage, I, I, get away and study it for yourself. I imagine that your pastor probably has a wonderful teaching series on this very passage, so I'm going to speak to you as men who are already somewhat familiar, and I'm just really going to emphasize one aspect of this, and I think you can tell just as I read these first few verses. Ephesians chapter 6, starting out verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand Stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then look at just the beginning of verse 14. Stand, therefore. Guys, do you get a theme here in these verses? Isn't it pretty powerful how Paul, in this whole section of introducing the armor of God, something that's essential for a productive and protected and successful Christian life, for every follower of Jesus Christ, that he emphasizes actually what the armor of God is for. What is it given to us for? It's so that we can stand, so that we can withstand the attacks of the enemy, and that we can therefore stand especially in the evil day. You could describe it like this, that to stand describes what we use, the strength of God, because remember how he begins this section, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Okay, great. What do I use the strength of God for? Paul would say, stand. And, and then I have all this spiritual armor. I have the, the breastplate of righteousness. I have the helmet of salvation. I have the sword of the spirit. I have the whole equipping that God gives to the man of God. What do I do with it? Stand, Paul says. That's to be the result that it works in the life of a Christian soldier. Now, you know, when you think about soldiers and warfare and armies and all their operations, you think about it that there's several different aspects to the battle to be fought. There is very definitely an offensive or an aggressive, an attacking mode that sometimes we take in the conduct of our spiritual lives and living out our lives as Christian men. You see, sometimes there's the offensive maneuvers, there's the attack where we uh, assault the kingdom of hell, and we're sort of on patrol against demons and spiritual enemies. I mean, you guys know what it says in Matthew chapter 16, don't you? Where Jesus said, and also I say to you, that you're Peter, 
And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And some people have taken that image to kind of have this idea that the church is to assault the gates of hell. Now, technically, in that particular passage, I don't really believe that that's what it's speaking about. It's important to understand what's meant by that ancient phrase, the gates of Hades. You see, in the ancient world, the city council and the judges and the city leadership would gather together at the gates of the city and they would plan the city's operations and they would govern the the city's uh, works and all the rest of it. It was the place where strategy was made. And so when Jesus talks about the gates of Hades, he really means the satanic strategies, the, the plots from hell. And he's telling us that no plot from hell is ultimately going to succeed against the church. And that's a very precious promise, isn't it? So I don't think Jesus is necessarily telling us that we have to assault the gates of hell. Yet, isn't it true that sometimes in living our Christian life and taking up opportunities for the kingdom of God, it is very much like that. There's some corner of darkness in the own neighborhood where we live, whether you live in a high neighborhood or a low neighborhood. There's some place where Satan's triumphing, and sometimes we just feel that the Spirit of God would lead us to make an assault for the kingdom of God upon that place. There is very much a place for this sort of uh, offensively minded, attacking viewpoint in the Christian life to say, listen, the devil has seized that ground, and we're going to take it back in the name of Jesus. But listen, what I want you to understand is that's not what the Apostle Paul primarily has in mind in this passage in Ephesians 6. Did you ever notice that? In Ephesians chapter 6, the image that's most ready in Paul's mind is not primarily of the church going out and attacking and seizing ground, even though there is a legitimate place for that concept. The dominant image in the Apostle Paul's mind is that the church stands that Christian men link together as soldiers and they stand against the wiles and the operations of the devil. And I think this is a very important concept. You know, if you want to think about it in terms of the ministry of Jesus, I don't really think that Jesus patrolled around looking for demons to conquer. You know, that would almost allow demons to set the agenda for Jesus's ministry. Instead, Jesus knew what God the Father wanted him to accomplish. And he went out with a single mind and a single heart to go out and to accomplish the will of God under the leading of the Holy Spirit. And wherever satanic opposition came in the way, he blew right through it. So many times, Jesus was simply living his life and doing his ministry under the operation of the Spirit of God. And he would be confronted by an aggressive demonic opponent. And Jesus would basically said, you're not gaining any ground here. I'm standing against you. Remember that with the gathering demoniac? Where the gathering demoniac tried to intimidate Jesus by just saying, we're not one, we're an entire legion. What did Jesus say? Oh my, that's so scary. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm standing against you. Get out. You don't belong here. And Jesus did exactly what Paul counseled here in Ephesians chapter 6 for believers to do. He stood. He made his stand. Look at it again. I'll just read you from verses 11 and 13 again of Ephesians chapter 6. He says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then now verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It's a very powerful military picture, this idea to stand. You know, in military history, there's this great and glorious lineage of those who made a stand against sometimes an insurmountable enemy, but they made a stand at a critical time. In 480 BC, the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, they stood against the Persians and they said, you're not going past us. You know, as a matter of fact, they all died in that battle. But at least the Spartans and the other Greeks who fought with them there at Thermopylae, they slowed the Persians down enough to where there could be a coordinated Greek defense against them, and they ended up winning the day in the end. Why? Because they stood. I think about it in the year 720, when Islam was conquering up through southern Europe. 
especially through Spain. They occupied all of Spain. And as they began to move the line of their civilization up north towards Europe, there, near the city of Tours in France, Charles Martel. Martel means the hammer. Isn't that a great nickname to have? Charles Martel, the hammer, he and the Frankish army, they were famous for not scattering and running as the other European armies had done in previous engagements with the, with the Muslims. But no, there, there near the Battle of Tours, the Frankish armies under Charles Martel, they said they stood like a wall and they refused to budge. And the tide of European history was turned at the Battle of Tours. Men, in the ancient world it was said that a Roman centurion must be the kind of man who could be relied upon, who when he was hard pressed, he would stand fast and not give way. Matter of fact, Roman soldiers were well known for the studded sandals that they wore. It was part of their special equipment and it helped them to dig in and stand the line against an advancing enemy. I mean, you can think of it in terms in the modern day world if you just want to think of it in terms of an offensive line on a football game. I mean, there's the offensive line and they've got all the equipment they need. They've got the armor, don't they? And there they stand. And you know how important it is? You can never win a football game if your quarterback is constantly sacked. You can never win a football game if your running backs are always getting thrown for a loss. The offensive line needs to stand against an onrushing enemy. And oftentimes, the entire weight of the game rests upon the, the shoulders of those men on the offensive line. That's just how it works. And so when you think about it, and the responsibility we have as Christian men to stand in the critical hour, you realize that there's a lot bound up in just that one little word. Think about it. Do you know what it means when God challenges you to stand? I'll tell you, one, number one, it means you're going to be attacked. Why do you need to stand if you'll never be attacked? You're going to feel the heat of the pressure against you. You're going to be in those circumstances where morally and spiritually and with the depths of your character, you're going to have to dig in and resist for the glory of God against the onrush of the enemy. You're going to be attacked. But why do we act surprised sometimes when we're attacked spiritually? This is just part of it. God would have never told us to stand with this kind of determination if it was never going to happen. Secondly, it means... That you must not be frightened in the midst of the attack. Can you imagine a whole cohort of soldiers trying to stand against an advancing enemy? And one of them seizes in fright and lets the enemy through on that one point in the line. The battle's lost. No, you must not be frightened. You must say this is just part of the battle. And God giving me strength. I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm going to advance forward and hold my ground. God helping me. It means... That as soldiers of Jesus Christ, we must not droop. We must not slouch. We must not be uncertain. We must not be half-hearted in the fight. There's not room for an ounce of self-pity. Men, in this Christian warfare that God's given us to fight, let's not give in to self-pity. I know there are probably many men among us who are in the thick of spiritual battle. It seems like a tsunami-like wave of Satan is coming against you and is about to crash upon you. And it instills a little bit of fear in your soul and perhaps worse yet, a bit of self-pity. Can you just put that away today in the name of Jesus? And say, God helping me, I'm going to stand. I won't give in to it. And it means when you stand that you don't have a single thought of retreat. If you think about that determined soldier who's standing, the last thing in his mind is that he'll take a step backwards. No, he's dug in. If he's going anywhere, he's going forward to hold that line and to stand new ground. But he's not going to give an inch to that enemy that presses in upon him. He's at his position. He's alert and he's ready. It's a whole lot that's wrapped up in that simple word to stand. So the idea is pretty simple. God has given us a call, a course, a mission to fulfill, and Satan is going to do his very best to stop it. We understand this, don't we? This is not a surprise. But 
When Satan attacks and seeks to intimidate us and to push us off the position that Jesus Christ has given us, we are to stand. And clearly that's Paul's emphasis here in Ephesians chapter 6. I don't mean to get overly repetitive, but I'm just going to read it again. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I mean, isn't that stirring? It's a challenge for each and every one of us. The goal of the battle is to stand in the evil day. And after we've done all here, Paul doesn't really have the idea primarily of attacking an offense, even though that's a valid concept and it's worth talking about. I'm just trying to point out that Paul's real emphasis in this passage is to stand. And men, what I want you to consider is that you, as a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ, and if that doesn't describe you, if you're not born again by God's Spirit, if you're not part of the new covenant and the community that God forms together as those who have put their faith in Jesus, and as General Boykin has said, are saved by grace alone and not by what they do, that those who are in that position in Christ, they have a standing that is given to them by God. It's as if God gives you this and then strengthening you and empowering you and filling with you with the Holy Spirit. He says, listen, my son, this is what I give you. It's your birthright as a believer in Jesus Christ. I give it to you, but you better know Satan's going to do his very best to shake you off of it. Here's the standing. Here's the spoils of the victory. They're yours. Don't you let Satan take it away from you. So what is the standing of the believer? Well, guys, I've got six or seven New Testament passages that just speak very briefly about aspects of the believer's standing. So you ready? Fingers warmed up to turn around to some pages here. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Let's start there. And I want you to know, I've made it very easy for you. I've even ordered these scripture passages sequentially. So you're just going to move, what is it, to the right in your Bible. But we're going to start at um, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Just look at this. Romans 5, 2. He says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Do you realize that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a standing in grace? God's put you in the midst of his grace. There you are. That's your standing before him. You don't stand in works. You don't stand in a law. You certainly don't stand in condemnation or judgment. God's giving you this standing of grace. And man, how do you know, or how many of you know, that the devil would love to shake you from that standing of grace? That this is a position that God has given you. And now he says, I'm going to equip you with the armor of God so that you can dig in and prevent Satan from shaking you from this glorious standing that I've given you. How many men have been removed from their standing in grace, and now they live in law. Now they live in legalism. Now they live under the condemnation of guilt. Now they live in this idea that it's primarily by their own works that they achieve a right standing with God instead of based on what Jesus Christ has done for them. You see the simple point I'm trying to make? This isn't complicated. I'm just trying to tell you. God has given you a standing of grace. The devil wants to shake you from it. Don't let him do it. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That's not the only way in which you stand. Turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, speaks about another aspect of the believer's standing. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received and in which you stand. Well, you stand in the gospel, don't you? What does it mean to stand in the gospel? The gospel is the, the, the description, the announcement of what Jesus Christ did to make your salvation. That Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. That's how Paul describes the gospel right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The understanding of the gospel helps you to understand that your Christian life at its core is about what God has done for you. Do you realize that? 
At the core, your Christian life is about what God has done for you. Now, you want to know what Satan wants to do? He wants to move you from that standing. He says, you, there's a believer. They stand in the gospel. I want to shake them off that. And instead, I want to make them think that the core of their Christian life is about what they do for God. I mean, please, I believe that men should be active in serving God. I believe that men should have a high bar for themselves to serve the Lord, to honor him, to do good works, you know, in their own life, in their families, in their community. We should have a very high calling for that. But listen, we all understand that the core of our relationship with God is not what I do for him, it's what he did for me. That's the gospel, isn't it? And, and it's all about horses and carts, and what should be in front, and what should come behind. And the work of God for me should lead the way. What I do for him follows right behind. The problem with some of us is that Satan shakes us from that standing, and we end up trying to put the cart before the horse, and it doesn't work. So, man, God's given you a standing. He's made you a place right there for you to stand in the gospel. Do not let the devil shake you from it. Let's look at another aspect of our sand. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Just a few pages over in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. He says, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Isn't that beautiful? You, the blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ, you, as a son of God, you stand in faith. Now, how many times has Satan tried to move you off that position that Jesus Christ has given you and tried you to move you off into a position of unbelief? Man, you, you wouldn't be here at all if you didn't have some trust in God. Of course you believe. Here's the problem is that you're in that place where that poor man who so much wanted to see his child healed by Jesus said, do you remember that? And these are very endearing words. I think we can all identify him with it. He said, he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And it's true, you do believe. But don't you want so badly to have God deal with the areas where you're filled with unbelief? You've given up, haven't you? Weren't you touched last night? When Pastor Joe led us in prayer, special prayer, for prodigals in our midst. Now, man, I, I know what some of this struggle is like in my own life. And I've seen God gloriously answer prayer, but I also know the sense of hopelessness that can come across a man in the midst of the season when his child may be living in a prodigal time. And you may believe God for a hundred other things, but in that particular area, the devil's moved you off from your standing in faith, and now you're sliding off into unbelief. You're being swept off into unbelief. Can you just say right now, God helping you, you're going to come and you're going to stand in faith. This is the standing that God has given you. May I read this verse again? Because I'm not making this up. Look right here, 2 Corinthians 1.24. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but you are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. It's by faith. And God has given you this standing in faith. Do not let the devil shake you from it. You know, men, what some of you need to do is you need to get a little holy anger against your unbelief. I'll tell you the prescription for unbelief is to question it. Now, sometimes people question faith, and I think it's okay to question faith. I think our faith should be able to prove itself. I mean, we, we have a faith that may go beyond reason, but it's not anti-reason. Our faith is founded upon reason. God has given us reason to believe. And so I don't, doubt, I don't uh, mind, I should say, when people come and they want to give evidences for faith. That's fine. But do you demand that your unbelief give evidences? Come on now. Unbelief, let me question you. Why don't I believe God? Has God suddenly become unreliable? Has God suddenly gone back on his promises? Has our great high priest somehow stepped off his throne in heaven and no longer cares for and comforts and intercedes for his people? No. 
But you see, I don't want to uncritically receive unbelief. When it comes my way, I want to stand and question and push it away, believing the promises of God instead of that whisper of unbelief that comes into my mind. Let's go on to the next one. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he says there, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Man, do you see the exhortation there? That we're to stand fast in Christian liberty. God has made us free men. What a lie it is from Satan. And this is a lie that moves many men off their position. It's a lie from Satan that somehow freedom is found in disobedience. And when you come to Jesus, then somehow you're enslaved. What a deceptive lie that's actually 180 degrees different from the truth. The truth is true liberty, true freedom is found in Jesus Christ. And you want to talk about slavery? Then you just go follow your lifestyle of sin, and that's slavery. You know, it's really a wonderful illustration that I heard when I was just a young Christian, but it's really a very powerful one. It really stuck in my mind. Think about a dog. Now think about an obedient dog, a dog that does everything you want it to do. You could take that dog with you anywhere. That dog could come to church with you, couldn't it? Because it doesn't, it, you say sit, it sits. You say be quiet, be quiet. You say come, it comes. You say don't wet on the floor, it doesn't wet on the floor. A dog that's perfectly, bit, it has total liberty. It can go with you everywhere. But let's say that a crossways thought gets in that dog's mind and that dog says simply, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to bite who I want to bite. I want to bark where I want to bark. I'm, I'm going to pee where I want to pee over and over again. What do you have to do with that dog? You got to lock it up on a short chain in the backyard. And that dog that thought that doing whatever, whenever he wanted to was liberty is fastened by a short chain in the backyard. But the dog that knows obedience, it has the liberty to go anywhere. Man, that's an illustration of the freedom that obedience before God gives us. There is no more liberated free man than a believer. This is what Jesus Christ has given you as a birthright, as his follower. Follower, This is the standing that God has given you. Don't you dare let Satan shake you from it. Don't you dare let Satan rob you from the liberty that's your birthright. Rob you because of disobedience. Rob you from because of the tyranny of man or sin or rebellion. Never. He's given you this liberty. Stand. Dig in your heels against the devil. Here's another aspect. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Turn over to there. See how I've done this way? You keep turning right and right. Isn't that simple? Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Do you see what he's saying right there? That we stand together in Christian unity. Let me read the essential line there from verse 27 again. That you stand fast in one spirit. One of the dominant themes of this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi was the idea of unity. There's several different dominant themes in Philippians, but that's one of them. It's unity. And here he's telling them, you stand fast in that unity. God has given you this position. And the glorious truth about the unity that God has given us is that is the gift of Jesus Christ that joins us together. Jesus does not separate his people. Man does that. Matter of fact, we are even not told to achieve the unity, but rather to simply receive it and to walk in it and to uh, bear with, to, to, to endure it, to keep it going, the unity of the spirit that God gives us. And isn't this fantastic? God has given us as men this position where we are one in the body of Christ. How dare we let Satan push us off that position and divide us unnecessarily? Listen, we are brothers, and we stand together. 
how Satan would love to slice us and dice us and divide us. But instead, what do we do? We say, no, I'm going to stand against that. I see the unity that God has given us that is our birthright as the followers of Jesus Christ. We will not give an inch on that quarter. All right, just a couple more. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Take a look at this one. He says, Therefore, my beloved, and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my beloved. Isn't this simple? Where are we to stand? We're to stand in the Lord. And to keep a God-focused Christian life. Now, I say that, you might think, well, David, that's the most obvious thing in the world, to have a God-focused Christian life. Is it really? Do you realize how many people fill churches every week that actually do not have a Jesus-focused Christian life? They have a social-focused Christian life. They have an events-focused Christian life. They have a religious ritual-focused Christian life. They have a, 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 a good deeds or on and on focused Christian life. The one thing that they refuse to focus on is Jesus himself. But no, no, no. We stand fast in the Lord. Now, again, I want you to have this position. I want you to have this mental picture vitally in your mind that you're like a soldier standing on this position. God has put you on this piece of real estate that you stand in the Lord. And I just want you to imagine that Satan wants to push you off of that position. He doesn't like it that you stand in the Lord. That's a threat to him and to his kingdom. He longs to push you off that position. But God helping you with the strength of the Lord and with the armor of God, you're going to dig in your sandals and you're not going to be moved. You're not going to be moved from that position that Jesus Christ has given you. Finally, let's look at this one. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, where he says this. He's speaking of Epaphras, one of Paul's trusted companions. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, which is a beautiful idea. There's Epaphras laboring in prayers. By the way, just a side comment, men, you know that, that sometimes prayer is sweet and glorious and just feels wonderful. Other times it's just flat out hard work laboring fervently in prayers. Now go on, the rest of the verse, verse 12. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Isn't this the standing that Jesus Christ has given you? That you would be perfect and complete and in all the will of God. This is the real estate that God has given you to defend. There's the will of God for your life. Your calling, your gifts, your heavenly destiny, that place where everything that God has poured into you and all the ways that the Holy Spirit has worked in you and around you to fulfill who you are as a man serving him, that's what God wants you to live and walk in, full and complete or perfect and complete in the will of God. Man, that's your standing. I would be very gratified if this message made some of you angry. Now, not angry with me, hopefully, but angry with the devil. And, and somehow a light has gone on in your minds. I've been ripped off. God has given me a standing. It's God's will, it's my place in him that I would stand perfect and complete in the will of God. And as I look at my life right now, I know I'm a child of God, but I'm not in that place. I've been pushed off of it. I've had enough of it. It's not going to go on anymore. No, God helping me with the strength of God filling my life and the whole arm of God equipping me, I'm going to make my stand and come into that place and not be moved from the perfect and complete will of God that God has for me. You see, it's a very powerful picture, isn't it? Matter of fact, sometimes I think that our attitude should be very much like Jesus and Jesus, that he could stand so strong, so firm against every attack of the evil one. So much so that in John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus made a remarkable statement. Let me read this to you. From John 14, 30, he said this, The ruler of this world is coming, 
meaning Jesus, meaning Satan. Jesus said that regarding Satan. The ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Isn't that a powerful statement? Nothing. There is not a single nail in my character that Satan can hang his disgusting garbage. I give him nothing. No foothold, no finger hold, no toe hold, nothing. I stand against him. And really, isn't that part of the glorious life of Jesus? Which, by the way, even being the Son of God as part of his yielding to the miracle of the incarnation, he, in a holy compact with God the Father, agreed to live his life as a spirit-filled man, not under the prerogatives of his deity, showing us what God can do through a genuinely submitted, spirit-filled man. Now, man, I, I'm not for a moment trying to say that we can reach this perfection of Jesus. But I just want to know, to what extent could you echo this same statement from Jesus, that the ruler of this world is coming, and to what extent could you say, he has nothing in me? You look around, there's different hooks, there's different nails, there's different footholds in your life where Satan can make a grasp or hang his disgusting garbage. That's not standing. You know, to sort of mix metaphors a little bit, you make the stand and you make it by removing to the best of your ability before God any opportunity that Satan has to gain a foothold or to make an attack against you. Is this a wonderful idea? Can you let this sink down deeply into your thinking and saying, yes, Lord, you've given me a standing. You've given me a position and I don't want to be shaken from it. Now, let me add one place where you should not make a stand in a sense. And if you want to turn to that, keep turning right. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. I'm asking you to turn to one more passage more than anything just because I love the sound of Bible pages turning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Do you know this verse? What does he say? He says, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Where does he say? Paul doesn't say make a stand here. When youthful lusts come, what do you do? You flee. And I just want to say, and I mean, I can say, and General Boykin referred to it as well, but I think we can make reference to it. You don't have to be young to be under attack from youthful lusts. But when they come, flee. Don't stand in their presence. Don't try to act like what a strong man you can be, how much temptation you can resist when it comes to youthful lusts that come against you. What do you do? You flee for safe ground. And when they're, make your stand at the safe ground, but remove yourself from those youthful lusts. That's an aspect of cleansing that Paul is mentioning to Timothy. And those youthful lusts describe any of the desires and the temptations that are specially prominent among those who are adolescent or young adults. Sexual temptations, the illicit temptations or pleasures of the flesh, the longing for fame and glory. Those often mark one's youth. And what does Paul say to do? To flee them. I like that contrast. Yeah, there's places to stand in the Christian life and there's other places to say, get yourself out out of there. Remove yourself from that dangerous environment. And so he says, don't entertain the youthful lust. Don't challenge them. Don't try to endure them. That idea, oh, I'll just test myself on this one to see if I can stand against it. Hasn't that made many, many men fall into sin? And I'll add this, men, if you cannot flee youthful lusts, then there's a real limit to how much God can use you. There's a limit to how useful to the master you can be. You can't really say yes to God until you can say no to some other things. And so he says, flee those youthful lusts. But back to our major point, with those rare exceptions, what does God tell us to do in regard to the strength of the Lord and the spiritual war that he gives us to fight? What does he say? He says, stand. Now, let me add one last aspect to this. Stand, but don't stand alone. 
Amen. There may be rare occasions in your life or my life where God calls us to stand alone. There's nobody who can come beside us. There's nobody who stands right by our side. There's not another brother that we can rely on in the name of the Lord. There may be those very rare, rare occasions, but they're conspicuous by their rarity. In every day walking with God, we can only stand if we stand with our other brothers. You know, this was very well known in ancient warfare. The Greek phalanx and its evolution to the Roman legions was organized so that men could stand together locked in combat. They had a way of arranging themselves as soldiers and locking themselves together. They were like an impenetrable wall. The 10 men who were locked together in such a way that they could stand, where if you split those 10 men up as individuals, they could never stand against the onrushing enemy. But together, collectively, standing together, we can stand. So stand with your brothers. Stand with them for your sake. You need their help. But not just for your sake, for their sake. In good heavens, would there be a brother here who would say, well, look, you know what? I do pretty good on my own. I really don't need to share my life. I really don't need to stand with another brother. I do pretty good on my own. Is, is there really a brother who would say that in our midst? Because even if it were true about you, which I strongly doubt, but even if it were true, then why don't you stand with your brother for his sake? Not just for yours. But friends, especially, can I say this? And weren't we touched when General Boykin asked all the fathers to come up with their sons? Doesn't it remind us that if you're going to stand with anybody, stand with your sons. Why don't you have a good talk with your sons and say, son, in our family, we need to stand against some stuff. Will you stand with me against those things? Here are some things that God has given us to stand. He wants us to stand in grace. He wants us to stand in the gospel. He wants us to stand in courage and strength. He wants us to stand in faith, in liberty. He wants us to stand in unity and in the Lord. He wants us to stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Son, that's how it's going to be in our family. But I, as your father, I can't do it alone. I need you to stand beside me. We're the men of this family. We need to stand together. Don't you need that from your son? Let me remind you that even if you don't need it from your son, your son needs it from his dad. And you stand and you stand together. Man, at the end of it all, I'll be very blunt with you. You're either going to stand or get swept away. And as the day becomes more evil, that wave that crashes against the people of God is going to get bigger and more mighty against us. And I'll say it, you're either going to stand or get swept away. So what do you do? You follow exactly what Paul told you to do in Ephesians chapter 6. You're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you can stand and stand against all enemies in the evil day. Father, I pray that you would simply equip every man here, especially the man who speaks into this microphone, to stand. We feel, Lord, as if there's a mighty enemy. We feel, Lord, that there they are rushing against us, the world, the flesh, and the devil with all their might. And we would despair were it not for the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, who leads us into every victory. Were it not for the strength of God that fills our life, were it not for the armor of God that he bestows upon every believer, and were it not for the promise and the position that you give us to stand. So, Lord, while full appreciation we have of the evil that's out there in the world, the flesh, and the devil, we commit ourselves to you once more, and we pray that not a single inch of sanctified ground would be yielded to the enemy, but that we would stand, especially in this evil day. We pray it, Lord. And we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit among us. 
worshiping you together now in Jesus' name. Amen.